Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 212 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the mystery of bilocation. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Bilocation is a mysterious phenomenon in which someone appears to be in two locations at once. Sometimes it's multiple places at once. It's been reported for thousands of years, and historically, many saints have been reported to bilocate. Today, some psychics have been reported to bilocate. So what is bilocation? Who experiences it? And what's really going on? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, let's start with the basics. What is bilocation? As you said in the introduction, bilocation is a phenomenon that's reported when a person seems to be in two locations at once. Bi is a Latin prefix that means double or twice. So bilocation means being in two locations at once. Um, Sometimes, though, a person is reported or thing is reported to be in multiple locations. And so that's called multi-location, being in multiple locations at once. But to keep things uh, simple in this episode, we'll just be using the term bilocation and not worry about the distinction. Okay. So we said in the opening that this is a phenomenon, both reported in the religious world, which deals with mystical experiences, and in the psychic world, which deals with parapsychological experiences. So today's episode should be of interest both to religious people and to those who are interested in parapsychology. To make the concept of bilocation concrete, can you give some specific examples? We'll ultimately give examples from both the religious and the parapsychological perspectives. But to get us started, we'll look at uh, examples involving a single individual that are very well documented. Uh, The religious figure known as Padre Pio. He was an Italian mystic who was born in 1881. He died in 1968 at the age of 81 when I was a small child. And even though I wasn't a Catholic at the time, I did grow up hearing about him. In 2002, he was canonized as a saint. And I remember when that happened, Uh, even though today he's formally referred to as Saint Pio of Pietrelcina, I still think of him as Saint Padre Pio. And in fact, Pope Francis recently commented on how it's hard for us who grew up knowing of him as Padre Pio to think of him under another name. It's kind of like, yeah, it's St. Mother Teresa, not St. Teresa of Calcutta to those of us who grew up knowing Mother Teresa. Um, And in the future, we will be looking uh, at Padre Pio's life. But for now, uh, he is a recent individual whose experiences with bilocation are well documented. Then let's take that initial look at Padre Pio. What religious order was he a member of? He was a Capuchin, and the Capuchins are a branch of the Franciscans. The Franciscans were founded by St. Francis of Assisi in the 1200s, and then the Capuchins are a branch of them that was founded in the 1500s. They're known for wearing brown robes that have hoods. And yes, this is where Capuchin monkeys get their names. Uh, When Portuguese explorers got to the Americas, they found these little brown monkeys with light colored faces, and they thought they looked like Capuchin friars with their hoods down. So they called them Capuchin monkeys. So far as I know, there are no reports of Capuchin monkeys bilocating, but in the novel Brideshead Revisited, author Evelyn Waugh does discuss rumors of secret monkeys (laughs) in the Vatican. <laughs> what a great novel. When is Padre Pio first reported to have bilocated? It happened when he was 17 years old, so he wasn't even a priest yet. The year was 1905, just two years after he entered religious life. So it was while he was undergoing his studies, he was a seminarian. And what makes it particularly significant is how well documented it is. Even though it took time for its significance to fully emerge, uh, shortly after it happened, Padre Pio himself wrote down what his experience was, and he gave that report to his religious superiors who kept it in the archives for years. So in his account, Padre Pio wrote, Several days ago, I had an extraordinary experience. Around 11 p.m. on January 18, 1905, Fra Anastasio and I were in the choir when suddenly I found myself far away in a wealthy home where the father was dying while a child was being born. Then the most blessed Virgin Mary appeared to me and said to me, I am entrusting this child to you. 
Now she is a diamond in the rough, but I want you to work with her, polish her, and make her as shining as possible, because one day I wish to adorn myself with her. I answered, How is this possible, since I am still a mere seminarian, and do not yet know whether I will one day have the fortune and joy of being a priest? And even if I become a priest, how can I take care of this child, since I am so far away? Do not doubt. She will come to you, but first you will meet her at St. Peter's in Rome. After that, I found myself again in the choir. So shortly after this experience, Padre Pio wrote it down and gave the report to his superiors. The key points were, even though he was in the choir in his monastery, at 11 p.m. on January 18th, 1905, he suddenly found himself in the home of a, we of a wealthy man who was dying. And at the same time, the man's daughter, a, ba the, a baby girl, was being born. The Virgin Mary asked him to help the baby girl grow spiritually as a Christian, and she said that Padre Pio would initially meet the girl in Rome, but that she would later come to him so he could provide her spiritual direction. The night of January 18th, 1905 is a very specific time. Did any wealthy re people report an experience in their home that corresponded to Padre Pio's account? Yes, 350 miles north of where Padre Pio was is a city named Udine. It was the home of a man named Giovanni Battista Rizzani, or John the Baptist Rizzani, and he was indeed wealthy. He was in his early 40s, and he and his wife, Leonilda, had five children. But shortly after she became pregnant with their sixth, Giovanni Battista became ill. When Leonilda was in her eighth month of pregnancy, Giovanni Battista was so ill that he was in the process of dying. Normally, what would happen at this point is you would summon someone to go get the priest and give uh, Giovanni Battista the last rites, but he was actually, Giovanni Battista was a Freemason who didn't want anything to do with the church. So he forbade his wife from calling a priest, and as death approached, he entered a coma. And his Masonic friends started hanging around the house to keep a priest from coming to him at the last moment and giving him rites he didn't want. Author Bernard Ruffin picks up the story of what happened next. Leonilda, a devout Christian, prayed fervently to God that her husband might put his trust in the Lord before he died. About the same time that Fra Pio had his experience in the choir at Sant'Ilia a Pianisi, Leonilda was kneeling in prayer by the bedside of her husband, who was now in a coma. Suddenly, she looked up and saw a young man. She recognized his capuchin habit, but did not get a good look at his face. As soon as she saw him, he left the room. Leonilda got up to follow him, but he seemed to vanish into thin air. She had no time to try to figure out an explanation for the appearance and disappearance of this strange young man, for the family dog immediately began to howl, a harbinger, it was believed, of imminent death. Unable to stand the baying, Leonilda decided to go into the yard and untie the dog. Before she reached the doorway, however, the distraught woman, then in her eighth month, was seized with labor pains. She called the family business manager who lived on the premises, and he successfully helped her deliver her baby girl. So this was an emergency home delivery without a doctor or midwife present, and instead the family business manager had to do it. And the young uh, girl was a premature baby, having been delivered in the eighth month, which was a much bigger deal in 1905 than it would be today, since being born prematurely was a much riskier thing back then. And so you would normally baptize a premature baby as quickly as possible. It so happens that despite what Giovanni Battista originally wanted, a priest was on his way to give him the last rites, and so... The business manager went outside and demanded that the Masons admit the priest who was trying to enter. Even if they were carrying out the wishes of their friend who refused to see a priest, he said, they had no right to bar him from entering to baptize a premature baby. They relented, and the priest went into the house. Just as he entered the sick room, the dying man opened his eyes, regained consciousness for a short time, looked at the priest, and said distinctly, My God, my God, forgive me. The priest was able to administer the last rites, and the sick man died the next morning. So, like many people in their last moments, Giovanni Battista chose to seek God's mercy, and he received the last rites before he died. Now, we flash forward 17 years from 1905 to 1922. By this point, Padre Pio had been ordained a priest, and he was living in San Giovanni Rotundo, or St. John the Round, which is in southern Italy. 
the shape of Italy is often compared to a boot, and San Giovanni Rotondo is kind of where the ankle of the boot would be. Also by this time, the baby girl, who had been named Giovanna after her father, had grown up into a young woman, and in the summer of 1922, she was preparing to enter college. She and a friend were visiting uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and Giovanna wanted to go to confession. A guard told Giovanna and her friend that all the priests who were hearing confessions had already left, as it was almost time for the basilica to close for the day. Before they could exit the church, however, the girls encountered a young Capuchin priest who said that he would gladly hear Giovanna's confession. Giovanna emerged from the confessional and stood, waiting with her friend for the priest to emerge from his side of the booth. The only person to appear was an irate guard who demanded, What are you doing here? We're closed. You have to leave the basilica. Come by tomorrow morning and you'll be able to make your confession. But I already made my confession, Giovanna explained to him. We are waiting for the priest to come out of the confessional so that we can kiss his hand. He's a Capuchin father. The guard went up to the confessional and opened the door to the priest's compartment. You see, young lady, there's no one here. But where did he go? Giovanna exclaimed. We've been standing here, watching, and we haven't seen him leave. The girls agreed that there was no way the priest could have left the confessional without being seen by them. So we have another sighting, this time in Rome, of a Capuchin who mysteriously vanishes. Later that year, Giovanna Rosani did enter college, and someone ended up showing her a picture of Padre Pio. She thought he looked like the priest she had met at, in St. Peter's and wondered if he might be the same guy. Whether or not it was, he was gaining a reputation as a holy priest and a mystic, and so she and several friends went to see him in San Giovanni Rotondo the next summer. It was late afternoon when, standing in a crowd of people in the sacristy of the church, Giovanna caught her first glimpse of Padre Pio. To her amazement, he came up to her and extended his hand for her to kiss, as was the custom with priests in southern Italy, exclaiming, why, Giovanna, I know you. You were born the day your father died. Which, needless to say, confused Giovanna. The next day, Giovanna made her confession to Padre Pio, after which he said to her, At last you have come to me, my dear child. I've been waiting for you for so many years. Father, what do you want of me? The young woman asked. I don't know you. Perhaps you're mistaken and have confused me with some other girl. No, said Padre Pio, I'm not mistaken. I knew you before. No, father, Giovanna objected. I don't know you. I never saw you before. Last year, Pio continued, one summer afternoon, you went with a friend to St. Peter's Basilica, and you made your confession before a Capuchin priest. Do you remember? Yes, father, I do. Well, I was that Capuchin. Dear child, listen to me. When you were about to come into the world, the Madonna carried me away to Udine, to your mansion. She had me assist at the death of your father and told me... See, in this very room, a man is dying. He is the head of a family. He is saved through the tears and prayers of his wife and through my intercession. The wife of the dying man is about to give birth to a child. I entrust this child to you, but first you will meet her at St. Peter's. Last year, I met you at St. Peter's, and now you have come to San Giovanni Rotundo on your own accord, without my sending for you. And now let me take care of your soul as the heavenly lady desires. And Giovanna started coming to Padre Pio for spiritual direction, thus fulfilling the sequence of events predicted in his initial bilocation experience. The child would be born, she would initially meet him in Rome, and then she would come to him elsewhere so that he could give her spiritual guidance. Needless to say, after such a dramatic encounter with Padre Pio, Giovanna told her mother about it, and her mother came to meet Padre Pio. He told her, Madam, that little monk whom you saw walking towards the gallery of your mansion in Udine when your husband was dying was me. I can assure you that your husband is saved. The Madonna who appeared to me in the mansion and bade me pray for your dying husband told me that Jesus had pardoned all his sins and that he was saved through her maternal intercession. Both Giovanna and her mother were convinced that Padre Pio had appeared in their house on the night of her birth. Giovanna Rosani, who became the Marchioness Boschi of Cesena, remained a devoted disciple of Padre Pio and later gave a detailed deposition before the Archiepiscopal Curia of Manfredonia. The Curia noted that her account of what Padre Pio had told her about her birth and her father's death 
when she first talked to him at length in 1923, was in exact agreement with the account Padre Pio had written in 1905, a document which the Marchioness had not yet read. Padre Pio's account of his bilocation had been given to his superiors, and they had not shared it with anyone. So we have a very well-documented set of accounts involving two bilocations of Padre Pio. The first one in 1905 when he appeared on the night of Giovanna's birth, which was recorded shortly thereafter, and second in 1923 when he appeared in Rome to hear her confession and then vanished, which she also gave a deposition on. So how far back in history has bilocation been reported? One of the earliest that I'm aware of is from 500 BC, and it concerns the Greek philosopher Pythagoras, you know, the triangle guy with many cheerful facts about the square of a <laughs> hypotenuse. Uh, in his Life of Pythagoras, Porphyry of Tyre wrote that, Almost unanimous is the report that on one and the same day, he, Pythagoras, was present at Metapontum in Italy and at Taraminium in Sicily, in each place conversing with his friends, though the places are separated by many miles, both at sea and land, demanding many days' journey. And indeed, uh, Metropontum and Taraminium are quite distant. They're about 250 miles apart. Today, it's about a five-hour drive. But in the ancient world, that 250 miles would have represented many days of travel. So Pythagoras couldn't have naturally been at both places on the same day conversing with friends. Unfortunately, even though Porphyry says the account of this is almost unanimous among the sources he consulted, we don't have any of those sources, and Porphyry's biography was written near A.D. 300, so that's about 800 years after Pythagoras. Apparently, uh, this was a famous account concerning Pythagoras that was attested in multiple sources, but the earliest one we've got is from 800 years later, and that leaves a lot of time for a legend to develop. I thus don't think we should place a whole lot of weight on this account. So do we have other accounts of bilocation from the ancient world? Another is from the first century philosopher and wonder worker Apollonius of Tiana, who also reportedly bilocated. In his biography, The Life of Apollonius, the Athenian philosopher Philostratus wrote, When the plague began to rage in Ephesus, and no remedy sufficed to check it, they sent a deputation to Apollonius, asking him to become physician of their infirmity. And he thought that he ought to not to postpone his journey, but said, Let us go. And forthwith, he was in Ephesus, performing the same feat, I believe, as Pythagoras, who was in Thurii and Metapontum at one and the same time. He therefore called together the Ephesians and said, Take courage, for I will today put a stop to the course of the disease. And with these words, he led the population entire to the theater, where the image of the averting god, Heracles, has been set up. And there he saw what seemed an old mendicant, artfully blinking his eyes as if blind, as he carried a wallet and a crust of bread in it, and he was clad in rags and was very squalid of countenance. Apollonius therefore ranged the Ephesians around him and said, Pick up as many stones as you can, and hurl them at this enemy of the gods. Now the Ephesians wondered what he meant and were shocked at the idea of murdering a stranger so manifestly miserable, for he was begging and praying them to take mercy upon him. Nevertheless, Apollonius insisted and egged on the Ephesians to launch themselves on him and not let him go. And as soon as some of them began to take shots and hit him with, but with their stones, the beggar who had seemed to blink and be blind gave them all a sudden glance, and his eyes were full of fire. And Philostratus doesn't mean that metaphorically. He means the beggar's eyes were literally full of fire, real burning fire. <laughs> Then the Ephesians recognized that he was a demon, and they stoned him so thoroughly that their stones were heaped into a great cairn around him. After a little pause, Apollonius bade them remove the stones and acquaint themselves with the wild animal they had slain. When, therefore, they had exposed the object which they thought they had thrown their missiles at, they found that he had disappeared, and instead of him there was a hound who resembled in form and look a Molossian dog, but was in size the equal of the largest lion. There he lay before their eyes, pounded to a pulp by their stones, and vomiting foam as mad dogs do. Accordingly, the statue of the averting god Heracles has been set up over the spot where the ghost was slain. So, dramatic story, stoning a demon to death and stopping a plague. 
And this was at least recorded closer to the time it allegedly occurred than the one involving Pythagoras. Uh, Philostratus would have written this in the early third century, but Apollonius lived in the first. So that's a distance of about 150 years. Still sufficient time for a legend to develop, though. We've looked at a bilocation involving Padre Pio, who was a religious figure, and Pythagoras and Apollonius, who were philosophers and religious figures. But you said bilocation is often reported in parapsychological circles. Can you give an example of that? Sure. Uh, one of the guests we've had on Mysterious World is former military remote viewer Paul Smith. We talked with him back in episodes 156 and 157 about the Stargate remote viewing project. And in his book, Reading the Enemy's Mind, Paul discusses an incident when he was first being trained in remote viewing. The year was 1984, and Paul was in New York City for a training cycle with the psychic Ingo Swan. Ingo had Paul viewing a variety of targets, including the Kwajalein Atoll of Islands in the South Pacific. Paul states, Something strange happened in connection with the Kwajalein site. My sketch was of a radar facility near the airfield that covers much of the island. But along with the angles and framework of the radar, I also sensed the warm sunlight, languid tropical breezes, and swaying greenery. I remember feeling that it was beautiful there. Ingo was satisfied with the session and turned me loose for what was left of the afternoon. I walked across town to a bookstore on an errand for my wife. Before I even got to the store, though, something odd happened. It was nearing the second week of November, and a cold front was blowing through, accompanied by overcast skies and spitting snow. I walked along the gritty side streets, annoyed that I had left my jacket at the hotel. As a contrast to the scurrying flakes and blustery winds, I began to think again of the Kwajalein Atoll target I had done earlier that day. Once again, I began to sense the vaguely present warmth of the sun. I had the memory of clean sand on my toes, of the palm trees, and aroma-rich breeze. Impressions of deep blue, white-capped water fell as a backdrop behind the greenery. It was like a memory, but it drew me in. Had someone asked, I would have said that I had no illusions that it was real, no more than if someone asked about a daydream in which I was momentarily lost. But somehow I did get lost in it, forgot I wasn't there. I tuned out New York, tuned out the snow, the traffic roar, the smell of exhaust, and the cold sidewalk under my shoes. More and more, I embraced the sensations of a tropical island on the opposite side of the planet, and I no longer noticed my feet walking on the sidewalk, but felt instead that I was almost floating. Then suddenly I came back to myself. I could sense my body starting to topple over. I staggered right, fortunately away from the approaching crowds and traffic, but towards an open freight elevator door yawning in the sidewalk. To save myself from an undignified plunge, I put my hand on the ragged brick of a nearby building. The cold roughness against my hand helped clear my head. As I puzzled over this odd happening on my way home, books tucked securely under my arm, I decided I must have experienced bilocation. Ingo told us that bilocation occurred when a viewer is so caught up in the site, he transfers too much of his awareness there, leaving the rest of himself to manage the best it can. So that was Paul's first experience with bilocation, and other remote viewers have reported it happening to them as well. This experience was different than the others we've talked about. In the cases of Padre Pio, Pythagoras, and Ap Apollonius, they were reported being seen in the second location and interacting with people, but Paul didn't report being seen or interacting with anyone on the island. Is that a fundamentally different experience? Should it be considered something other than by location? There are differences between the reported cases. In some cases, the person by locating is seen and interacted with, but in other cases, he's not. And that happened with Padre Pio, too. In 1998, the magazine The Voice of Padre Pio published an article discussing a number of his bilocations. It was written by Father Carmelo Durante, one of the priests who lived with him in his monastery in Italy. In 1954 and 1955, he was the superior of Padre Pio's religious community, and he started meeting with some of the people that Padre Pio gave spiritual direction to with the purpose of learning more about his early years at the site. I knew from Mrs. Rossanella Gisolfi's friends that she had had the privilege, a well-documented fact, of seeing Padre Pio in bilocation from the first years of spiritual direction. During the meeting, she suddenly announced in a whisper that the Padre was present. Everyone was happy, I noted. Like all those present, I believed the announcement, but forgive me if I say so, 
women are known for their daydreaming. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that comment aged really well. Um, however, this was the 1950s, and Durante was acting on the premise that women are known for their daydreaming. So I wanted to get to the bottom of this. This was my first case of bilocation, and I wanted to know how it worked. The same evening, when I returned to the friary, I asked one or two confreres what the padre had done in the late evening. They answered, the usual. He conducted the evening benediction, then he received his friends, and we chatted together. I was afraid to ask the padre himself about the bilocation, being such a delicate matter. So Durante verified that Padre Pio was back at the friary, but he didn't initially talk to him about whether he was also present at the meeting with the women. However, after a later meeting, he did ask, Ah, you're back, he said as soon as he saw me, as if he knew nothing. I wish to note that Rossanella had told me that Padre Pio often accompanied me on my journeys in the car, etc., without my knowing. That evening, I replied at once, also so as to get the conversation going. Yes, Father, I have returned. Everything went well. Your spiritual children are very happy. But I would like to ask you one thing. And he... Yes, what is it? I began, Padre Rossanella. And then I lost courage. And he, with a strategy all his own, said... Rossanella, is she not well? If anyone, I was the one who felt not well now. No, Padre, she is well. And so he went on? I took the plunge. Padre, Rossanella said that you were always present at our meetings. And quite untroubled, he answered, Well, don't you want me there? Don't you want me to come to these meetings? Those were his exact words. I leave you to make up your minds. The same thing happened at our third meeting on 26 January. This time, when I questioned him, he answered, Yes, of course I was there as if to say, why, you don't believe me? On another occasion, it was he himself who asked me, aren't you going to ask me this time if I came? And I answered, but Padre, by now I am certain that you always come, so I don't ask you anymore. And with the kindness of a father, he said, yes, I accompany you always and everywhere. In one meeting, an unusual thing happened. At a certain point, a few members of the group began to speak badly about some people. It got a little out of hand when suddenly Rossanella, frightened, exclaimed, Father Guardian, Padre Pio has an angry face. We were all scared and quickly stopped and not without some embarrassment and self-accusation began to speak well of these people. A few minutes later, I asked Rossanella, Now how does Padre Pio look? And she said, He looks calm. We were happy again and had learned our lesson to not speak badly of people. I love that story where everyone is gossiping and the lady who sees Padre Pio says his face is angry and everybody quickly backtracks and starts <laughs> saying nice things and she says he now looks calm. But this illustrates that in Padre Pio's reported by locations, he wasn't always seen. Uh, in these meetings, only the one woman, Rosanella, saw him. And according to both her and Padre Pio himself, Padre Pio often bilocated to be with Father Durante, even though Father Durante never saw him. And there are many other cases of that in the literature, where people will have an awareness that Padre Pio is with them, you know, for example, when someone is on their deathbed, even though he wasn't seen by everybody who was present, or sometimes by anybody who was present, it was just an awareness they had of him. But all these experiences have still been grouped together under the general heading of bilocation. So we're either dealing with related but distinct phenomena, or we're dealing with uh, one phenomenon that can manifest in more than one way. Sometimes the person is seen, sometimes they're not. And Padre Pio isn't the only saint to have reported bilocations. Uh, far from it. A variety of saints have reported bilocation. Some of the more famous ones, including St. Anthony of Padua, St. Francis Xavier, St. Martin de Porres, St. Mary of Greta, St. Alphonsus Liguri, and even the Virgin Mary. Reportedly, the very first Marian apparition was an instance that occurred in which Mary bilocated. It is said to have happened in the year A.D. 40, so just seven years after the crucifixion, and when Mary still would have been alive and living in Jerusalem. And she reportedly bilocated to Spain in an apparition known as Our Lady of the Pillar. 
However, our earliest documentation of this seems to date from the Middle Ages, over a thousand years later. So I can't put a lot of evidential weight on that. I prefer to stick with the better documented accounts where we have contemporary or near contemporary documentation. We've looked at cases where bilocation has been reported in non-Christian but still religious contexts, as with Pythagoras and Apollonius, and in non-religious contexts, as with the psychic training that Paul Smith was receiving. So this isn't reported exclusively among Christians. No, it's also reported in other religious communities, including Hinduism and Buddhism, where it's classified as one of the siddhis or paranormal abilities that one is supposed to be able to gain through various disciplines. It's reported in Islamic and Sufi mysticism, in Jewish mysticism, in shamanism, in different cultures, and in theosophy and other new religious movements. So it's quite a widely reported phenomenon, and we'll need to look at it from both the faith and reason perspectives. Excellent. So before we get to our theories and faith and reason perspectives, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Richard R., Daniel B., Brian R., Catherine L., and Gregory S. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fearvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com, F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about bilocation? One of the things we need to do is map out the conceptual space of what may be happening. In other words, we need to look at the different ways bilocation can manifest and how they might relate to each other. We also need to look at other similar phenomena that may that bilocation may be connected with. We need to look at how credible the accounts of bilocation are, and we need to look at what may be causing it. Okay. So what can we say about bilocation from the reason perspective? You referred to mapping out the conceptual space it involves. What do we need to consider? A basic question we need to think about is if someone is present in more than one location at a time, what is the mode of their presence? Obviously, their physical body is located somewhere, and we'll call that their primary location. So when Padre Pio was in his friary, in his normal physical body, the friary was his primary location, even though he was also present elsewhere. Similarly, when Paul Smith was in New York with his normal physical body, then New York was his primary location, even though he may have been bilocating to an island in the South Pacific. And the reports seem to indicate that a person's normal physical body is present in a normal physical way at the primary location. We don't have reports of their normal body disappearing. If we did, the phenomenon would be teleportation rather than bilocation. So the real question becomes, what is the mode of their presence in the remote location that they bilocate to? In what way was Padre Pio also present when he showed up in the house of the Rizzani family in Udine? And in what way was Paul Smith also present on the Kwajalein Atoll? When it comes to the mode of presence in the remote location, it seems to me that there are two basic options, which we'll refer to as a physical mode of presence and a non-physical mode of presence. And what do you mean by those categories? By physical presence, I mean that there is something physical at the remote location. But there are a number of possibilities here. The first is that the person's normal physical body could be somehow in two locations at once. We'll call this type one physical presence. Their body is at the remote location and it's exactly the same body as at the primary location. It's just somehow in two places at once, even though it's only one body. Second, 
there may be a physical body at the remote location, but it's not the same as their normal one. In this case, the remote body would still be physical, but it would be like a duplicate of their original body. And we'll call that type two physical presence. Third, it may not be a physical body at the remote location, but it may still be something physical that you could see, uh, like a visible image of a person that you can see with your eyes, um, one that you could capture on camera. So, you know, this image, whatever it is, is reflecting physical photons, both to your eyes and to the camera lens, but it's not something you could physically touch. We'll call this type three physical presence. And fourth, there may be something physical at the remote location, even though you can't see it. We'll call this type four physical presence. In this case, it might be something like an electromagnetic pattern that you could pick up on an EMF or electromagnetic field reader. You couldn't see it or touch it, but it would still be physical because it would be picked up by instruments like EMF meters. We thus have a spectrum of things that may be present at the remote location, ranging from the person's full actual one physical body down to some kind of electromagnetic trace of the person. And what about the non-physical modes of presence? Do we see, see a similar spectrum of possibilities there? Yeah, we do. In this case, uh, there doesn't have to be anything physical at the remote site, meaning that there isn't anything there you could detect with physical instruments like an EMF meter or a camera, but there is still a range of possible experiences. The most vivid would be one where one or more people sees the bilocating person. We'll call this type one non-physical presence. And it's so vivid that they think that the bilocating person is physically there. They just look and see the person and they think they're seeing him with their physical eyes, even though in reality, there's no body there that's bouncing photons into their eyes. You might consider this a fully realistic or fully immersive visionary experience or hallucination, if you prefer that term. In, in any event, it's something that's happening in their minds rather than in the physical world. This is like what we heard about in episode 210 on the haunted house of Marin County, where the family was seeing an apparition of a six-year-old girl, and the mother thought it was a real little girl until she suddenly vanished. Up until that point, she thought she was seeing a girl with her physical eyes and didn't think that there was anything unusual until the girl disappeared. A less vivid experience would be one where the person still thinks that they're seeing something with their physical eyes, but they can tell it's unusual in some way. So we'll call this a type two non-physical presence. In this case, the witness seeing the bilocating person can tell that something weird is going on, like maybe they look transparent or misty or not photorealistic in some way. And so you might call this a partially realistic visionary experience or a partially realistic hallucination. The person still thinks that the image is coming through their eyes, but they can tell it's not quite normal. Less vivid still would be an experience where the person doesn't think that their physical senses are engaged, which we'll call a type three non-physical presence. In this case, the witnesses are still having sensory impressions, but they can tell they're not coming through their eyes or ears. Instead, they know that they're seeing the bilocating person in their mind's eye. So it's, it's just a mental image. Also, like we heard about in episode 210, where Lloyd Auerbach uh, saw a man with long blonde hair being killed, but he could tell it was just a mental image, not something he was seeing with his physical eyes. The least vivid kind would be where the witness doesn't have any sensory experiences at all. So this will be type four non-physical presence. In this case, the witness doesn't see, hear, feel, or smell the bilocating person. Instead, the witness just feels the person's presence somehow. So it's a feeling rather than a sensory experience. And finally, there can be types of experiences where the witnesses aren't witnesses. They don't perceive anything. Uh, this will be type five non-physical presence. So here, it's only the bilocating person himself 
who is having the experience. He experiences being at a second location and he gets to look around and see who's there and observe what they're doing and saying, but nobody at the site perceives or feels his presence. Like when Padre Pio was reported to accompany Father Durante in his car without Father Durante knowing it, or maybe like when Paul Smith showed up on Kwajalein Atoll during a particularly intense remote viewing experience and nobody seemed to see him from what we know. You mentioned other senses besides sight, like hearing and smell. Does that mean bilocations sometimes occur that don't involve sight? Oh, yeah. There are multiple possibilities in terms of the senses that can be involved. I focused on sight because humans are primarily visual creatures. We depend on sight more than any of our other senses. But there's nothing that says sight has to be involved. In some cases, people reported hearing a bilocating person's voice. In other cases, they reported a feeling of a physical touch from the other person, like the person touched them. Um, in other cases, they reported a particular smell. For example, in Catholic mystical literature, there's a phenomenon known as the odor of sanctity. And sometimes people would report detecting Padre Pio's presence because they noticed a particular aroma. Uh, some of the people who noticed it compared it to roses or other flowers and Others compared it to tobacco, and there are sweet-smelling pipe tobaccos, including ones with floral notes in them, even rose-scented ones, although in my experience, the rose-scented ones are kind of hard to get, or at least they are these days. So if you were doing an investigation of an olfactory or smell-based bilocation report, one of the things you need to do is make sure that nobody at the site was wearing floral perfume or smoking sweet-smelling pipe tobacco, or smoking in general, um, or that there was a flower garden nearby, because those would all be natural explanations that you would need to consider and eliminate in order to establish that bilocation was actually going on. But the point is that there are, there are multiple senses, you know, that we have, and any or all of them could be perceived by witnesses of a bilocation. And the witnesses might not might not all perceive the same thing, correct? Like when one lady at the Padre Pio meetings perceived him as being present, even though the others didn't. Right. Not all the witnesses may perceive the same thing. For example, when Jesus appears to St. Paul in the book of Acts, both Paul and his companions have sensory experiences, but they're not the same. All of them see a bright light, but it appears that Paul saw Jesus's form while the others didn't. Paul also heard Jesus's voice clearly, but the others didn't. So Paul seems to have been given a fully realistic sensory experience, while the others were having only a partially realistic experience. Something similar happens in John chapter 12, where God speaks from heaven, and some of the crowd perceive it as a heavenly voice, while others only perceive it as thunder. In the paranormal world, we have similar reports, like in episode 210, Lloyd Auerbach uh, had the mental image of the blonde guy being stabbed, but the other people with Lloyd didn't perceive that. And various remote viewers have reported that when they were distantly viewing a site, sometimes one or more psychically sensitive people at the site could perceive that they were there, where, whereas other people at the site didn't perceive them. So like... If, let's say, you're a Stargate remote viewer, you've been tasked to review the Kremlin, so you're remote viewing the Kremlin, and all of a sudden, one of the people at the Kremlin senses you and goes, hey, there's somebody viewing us. And the other people who are not as psychically sensitive are going, what? I'm not sensing anybody. So it, it can kind of go the other way around. Um, but uh, bottom line, different witnesses can report different things about the same event. If they do perceive the exact same things, that could be a sign that the bilocator is physically present, or it could be that the presence was non-physical and they were just having the same fully realistic experience. You mentioned how multiple senses may be involved in bilocation. What about fundamental kinds of presence? Would it be possible for a bilocation experience to have both physical and non-physical modes of presence? Potentially. Uh, this is something that gets discussed when it comes to remote viewing and related phenomena. It's 
possible that someone could be mentally present at a remote location, but there also might be something like a detectable electromagnetic trace of them at the site. In fact, one of the issues uh, discussed in remote viewing circles is whether there is anything detectable that goes to the site that is being observed. We talked about that a bit in episode 191, where I entered former military remote viewer Bill Ray. In that episode, he told us about some rumored Chinese experiments that reportedly showed that remote viewing a site can have a physical effect on the site, suggesting that something physical is happening there. And I've since run into more information on that subject, which we can talk about in the future. When we cover the types of theories we need to look at, you mentioned that we need to look at other phenomena that may be related to bilocation. What did you have in mind here? Well, one of them obviously is remote viewing, where a person is conscious of being in his body in one location, but he seems to be either at a remote location mentally or at least picking up information about a remote location. Actually, there are there's kind of a set of phenomena that are related here, and they include not only remote viewing, but also out of body experiences and living apparitions, and they kind of fall along a spectrum. In episodes 156 and 157, when we talked with Paul Smith, he told us about the kind of remote viewing that he typically practices, which is called controlled remote viewing or CRV. In controlled remote viewing, you are very much aware of being in your physical body. For example, you may be sitting at a desk somewhere, writing and sketching what you're perceiving about the remote location. Then in episodes 190 and 191, when we talked to Bill Ray, he told us about a different kind of remote viewing that he does, which is known as extended remote viewing or ERV. In extended remote viewing, you have a much more immersive experience. You're typically lying down on a bed and talking to a person who is monitoring the session. So you're definitely aware of and still in your body, but mentally you're having an experience of a remote location and feel like you're mentally moving around in that environment. Even more immersive than that are what are called out-of-body experiences, or OBEs. We haven't really talked about them on Mysterious World yet, but we will. And in an out-of-body experience, you lose awareness of your physical body. It feels like you're traveling to a remote location without your physical body. And this is similar to how people report being out of their bodies in near-death experiences, which we talked about all the way back in episode 27. So you can see how there's kind of a spectrum here from controlled remote viewing, where you're very aware of your physical body, but pick up limited sensory impressions of a remote location, to extended remote viewing, where you're still aware of your body, but have a more immersive experience of the remote location, to out-of-body experiences where you lose awareness of your body and still have an immersive experience of another location. And we'll have a link to an article by Paul Smith where he talks about the possible relationship between remote viewing and out-of-body experiences. So you can read more about that. Are there other paranormal phenomena that may be related to bilocation? Yeah, uh, apparitions may be related to bilocation. In particular, apparitions of living people may be related to bilocation. In apparitions of the living, the person has a living body that is located in one place, but then they're seen appearing in another location. This sometimes happens when a person is in a crisis of some sort, in which case it's known as a crisis apparition, like when a person is in the process of dying and they appear to their loved ones in a distant location, or they may be in grave danger and they appear to their loved ones at a distance at a, as a kind of a cry for help. We'll talk more about crisis apparitions in the future, but already in episode 210 on the Haunted House of Marin County, we encountered a living apparition where an old woman who lived just up the street was seemingly appearing at the house as a small girl. Such phantasms of the living look very much like reports of bilocation. In fact, apparitions of the living may be the primary explanation for bilocation, as we'll discuss in the faith perspective. Thus far, you've mentioned parapsychological phenomena that may be related to bilocation. Are there religious or mystical phenomena that may be related? Yeah, visions 
if God gives you a vision, it can be a vision of anything he wants. And as a result, God could give you a vision of a remote location, in which case you would be physically located in one place, but you'd be having a sensory experience of another place. Thus, you could seem to be in two places at once. And so bilocation could be explained in terms of vision. If you're bilocating, you could simply be having a supernatural vision of another location and the people at that location might or might not be having a supernatural vision of you. That's starting to get into the territory of the faith perspectives. But before we go there, let's look at the evidence regarding bilocation. How credible are accounts of bilocation happening? It depends on the account. Uh, Some are more credible than others. Like I said, uh, I don't place a lot of weight on the account of Pythagoras's bilocation because our earliest surviving record of it is from 800 years later. Most phenomena in the world have purely natural explanations. That's why we consider paranormal or supernatural phenomena to be outside of the normal and above the natural. They're not as common. Normally, things have a natural explanation. So if you're investigating a bilocation report, then you need to look for natural explanations first, just like in any paranormal or supernatural investigation. If you think you see someone who you know to be elsewhere, you need to consider whether it could just be misperception. Maybe it's just someone who looks like the person you're thinking of. Or if you think you're detecting a distant person by smelling the odor of sanctity, you need to look around to see if someone's wearing perfume or smoking a pipe. Or if you just feel the presence of someone but don't have any sensory experience, you need to consider whether it could just be your imagination. Do you think some reports of bilocation may simply have natural explanations? I'm sure many reports of bilocation may turn out to have purely natural uh, causes behind them. But as with any unusual phenomenon, you need all you need is one genuine instance to prove that a phenomenon is real. And this applies across the board, whether the subject is scientific or paranormal or religious demonstrate one Big Bang happened and you've proved the Big Bang. Show that one atom exists and you've shown atoms exist. Capture one Bigfoot, you've proven Bigfoot. Document one genuinely alien UFO and you've shown aliens are visiting Earth and demonstrate one case of psychokinesis or mind over matter, you prove that's real and show one genuine miracle, you've shown miracles are real. So whether it's scientific or paranormal or religious, all you need is one genuine case. So all in this, in on a, for our topic, if you can show one genuine case of bilocation, then you show that bilocation is real. So what do you think? Do we have genuine cases of bilocation? I, I, I think we do. When it comes to psychic reports of bilocation, like what happens in remote viewing, some of these are very well documented in government records. And when it comes to religious reports of bilocation, like what happened with Padre Pio, I think we do as well. We have multiple reports where Padre Pio himself acknowledged that he was somehow present in more than one location at a time. And we have this confirmed by people who both saw him in the location of his physical body and perceived him elsewhere at the same time. Furthermore, we have cases like his very first one when he was 17, where he wrote up the experience and entrusted it to his religious superiors immediately after the event. And then other people like Giovanni Rizzani confirmed this years later and gave independent depositions on the matter. While this doesn't provide controlled laboratory proof of bilocation, It provides enough that I think the phenomenon is real. That doesn't tell us what's causing it, though. From the reason perspective, what do you think is the ultimate reason? What about the causes of genuine bilocation reports? Well, bilocation is not a normal or natural phenomenon. Uh, It's not how physical bodies normally or naturally behave. Therefore, it must happen due to either a paranormal or a supernatural cause. If it's paranormal, it would seem to be an ability that is built into human nature. If it's supernatural, then it requires a cause outside of human nature, such as God. And, of course, uh, both explanations may apply. Some cases of bilocation may be paranormal. 
Some cases may be supernatural, and some cases may involve both, where human nature is getting a boost from a supernatural source. Distinguishing between paranormal and supernatural causes is rather difficult because we don't have a good grasp on how either kind of cause works. We do have a good grasp on the normal phenomena that occur around us. But when we start looking at non-normal, non-natural phenomena, it gets harder. Do you have any ways we could do that? It seems to me that the basic way to do it is by looking at the question of whether or not spirits are involved. If you're producing an effect that goes beyond what's normal, but you're not invoking spirits, then the effect would seem to be something that's rooted in human nature. In that case, it would seem to be a natural human ability, making it paranormal rather than supernatural. In other words, it would be what we today would call a psychic ability. And for more on that, you can go back and listen to episode 79 on religion, magic, psychic phenomena, and science. On the other hand, if you do need to invoke uh, spirits like angels or demons or God to produce the effect, then you're not relying on things that are just built into human nature. In this case, you're relying on super human or supernatural abilities. So I'd say if you don't invoke spirits, you're likely doing something paranormal. But if you are invoking spirits, then it looks more supernatural. And of course, God might induce you to bilocate without you doing anything. But God or heavenly messenger may tell you that he's responsible, like when the Virgin Mary spoke to Padre Pio in his first bilocation. I mean, that told him that this was just not just a natural experience, that heaven was involved. Even if we may have difficulty saying whether something was has paranormal or supernatural causation, can we shed additional light on bilocation from the reason perspective? For example, can a single body really be in two places at once? Yeah, I knew I, I wanted to find a place in this to refer to the Fire Sign Theater uh, album, How You Can Be in Two Places at Once When You're Not Anywhere at All. <laughs> um, they even have a little song in that, a guy is humming, oh, how you can be in two places at once when you're not anywhere at all. <laughs> um, in any event, uh, this is a question that Catholic theologians and philosophers have been discussing for centuries because it falls directly out of Jesus's teachings. The teachings themselves are matters of faith, and so they would need to be treated under the faith perspective, but they raise philosophical questions, and philosophy belongs to the reason perspective, so we'll discuss the philosophical issues here. The teaching that raised the issue of bilocation for these philosophers was Jesus' teaching about the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. He declared, and other passages in the New Testament also affirm, that during the Eucharist, the bread and wine don't simply remain bread and wine. Instead, Jesus' own body and blood become present. Right. Uh, thus, Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood. And historically, Christians have understood him to mean what he said. He's not just speaking symbolically or metaphorically. Instead, a miracle happens whereby Christ really and truly becomes present in the consecrated elements. And that's been understood by the vast majority of Christians, both throughout history and today. Um, although they may understand the way that Christ is present in slightly different ways, the belief he's really there is found among Catholics, which is half of all Christians today, um, among Eastern Orthodox, which is another quarter of Christians, other Eastern churches, and even many Protestants, including Lutherans and many Anglicans and Methodists. Though there are uh, other Protestants and offshoots of Protestantism where people disagree. The issue of whether uh, Christ is really present in the Eucharist thus belongs to the faith perspective, but you can see how it raises philosophical questions that need to be answered from the perspective of reason, because Ever since the ascension, Christ's body has been up in heaven. So how can it also be present in the Eucharist at different places in the world? That's something that goes beyond just being in two places at once. It involves being present in many places, and so it's called multilocation. But it's the same basic issue, just with more places involved. What did Christian philosophers conclude when they started looking into the subject? 
they concluded that based on Jesus' teaching, there must be a way for a body to be in more than one place at a time. They just needed to figure out how. And considering that question, they developed a technical vocabulary expressing different distinctions, like whether a body is circumscriptively or definitively in a place. And we'll have a link to the 1907 Catholic Encyclopedia where you can, where you can read about that. To cut through the philosophical jargon, they drew a distinction between two ways something can be in a place. How do those two ways work? The normal way that a physical body is in a place is by filling space so that part of the body has one location and another part of the body has another location. For example, your left hand and your right hand are both parts of your body, but they're in different parts of space. Because, the, because of the electromagnetic force, you can't even make them exist in the same place. Because if you try to push your hands together, the negatively charged electrons in your skin will repel each other, just like the north poles of magnets will repel each other. Well, so will negatively charged electrons. They'll repel each other and keep your hands apart. So your body fills space in a way that different parts of it are in different locations. And philosophers said that this way of being in a location was being there circumscriptively. And it's the normal way that physical bodies are present. What's the other way a body can be in a place? Uh, this one is illustrated by the human soul. The soul fills and animates our entire bodies. But Christian philosophers have viewed souls as not having parts. So it's not like a part of your soul is in your left hand and a part of your soul is in your right hand. Instead, they reasoned all of your soul is present in each part of your body. And they called this way of being in a place being there definitively rather than circumscriptively. And definitive presence is the normal way that a soul is in a location. But if these two modes of presence are possible, then God, by virtue of his omnipotence, could allow bodies to manifest in more than one way. And that could explain what's happening with the Eucharist. Christ's body is up in heaven circumscriptively, so if you were with him in heaven, you would see his right hand at a different point in space than his left hand. And by God's power, Christ's body is in the Eucharist definitively. So you don't see his Eucharist, you don't see his right hand in a different location than his left hand. Instead, all of his body is present at every point in the consecrated elements, the way that all our souls are present at every point in our bodies. At least, that's the common understanding historically. And having dealt with the issue of how Christ's body can be present in more than one place at a time, they sought to apply these same principles when they thought about how the bodies of saints could be present in more than one place at a time and by location. If God could make bodies that are circumscriptively present in one place and definitively present in another place, as with Jesus, then he could also do so for the saints. And that could explain some reports of saintly bilocation, like when Padre Pio's body is physically in his friary, but his presence is invisibly sensed elsewhere. But this theory wouldn't explain cases where he was visibly seen in more than one place. Back in his friary, people would have seen Padre Pio's right and left hands at different points in space, and at the Rosani family's house in Udine, they saw the same thing. So his body would seem to be circumscriptively in two places at once. Is that possible? On this question, there was a difference of opinion among philosophers and theologians. The 1907 Catholic Encyclopedia explains, Regarding the absolute possibility of a body being present circumscriptively in more than one place, St. Thomas, Vasquez, Silvanus Morris, and many others deny such possibility. Scotus, Bellarmine, Francisco Suarez, DeLugo, Frenzelin, and many others defend the possibility of circ circumscriptive replication. So some authors like St. Thomas Aquinas thought that a single body being present in two locations in the normal, spread out, space-filling way is not possible, even by God's omnipotence, because he thought that this would involve a contradiction. But other thinkers like John Duns Scotus thought that it didn't involve a contradiction, so God could make it happen. And what do you think? 
Well, this is one of a growing number of points where I agree with Duns-Scotus rather than Aquinas. I don't see this as involving a logical contradiction, and so I think it's something God can do. But in addition to this philosophical reason, I would also point out that modern science would suggest that Scotus is right on this. Uh, Aquinas, uh, Scotus, and even the 1907 Catholic Encyclopedia were all writing before modern physics. Albert Einstein, the E equals MC squared guy, uh, didn't publish his general theory of relativity until 1915, and it wasn't proved correct until they got observations of an eclipse in 1919. But general relativity holds that space can be warped by things like gravity. So space is not an absolute. It can be bent. And so God could fold space in such a way that a single body can be present in two places at once. Like if you fold a piece of paper in half and then put an object, let's say your hand, inside the fold. Uh, your hand will be making contact with two different and separate locations on the paper. And if God folds space around your body, your body may be in contact with two different and separate locations in space. I thus think it's entirely possible for a body to be in more than one place at a time due to the fact that space is not an absolute and can be bent. So I think Aquinas uh, and others of the same view were making a conceptual mistake by assuming that space is an absolute and thus that a body appearing circumscriptively in two places might be a, a logical contradiction. But space isn't an absolute and there is no contradiction. What about quantum mechanics? Sometimes people argue that quantum mechanics allows objects to be in more than one place at a time. That's true, uh, but we have to be really careful here. In the first place, it's only on some interpretations of quantum mechanics that an object can be in multiple places at once. And we don't know which interpretation of quantum mechanics is true. Also, uh, quantum mechanical effects like this tend to apply to very small objects, and they're much harder to, or even impossible to replicate with big macroscopic objects like human bodies. So as a result, I'm more inclined to appeal to relativity than to quantum mechanics to explain how a large body like a human one could end up in more than one place at a time. If thinkers like Aquinas didn't believe it was possible for a body to be present in more than one place, how do they explain instances of bilocation where a person was seen in two places at once? Well, the Catholic Encyclopedia explains. The instances of bilocation narrated in lives of the saints can be explained, they hold, by phantasmal replications or by aerial materializations. So by phantasmal replications, what the encyclopedia means is visionary experiences that replicate the person's appearance. So you're seeing the person's body in a vision. This is essentially the same thing as an apparition, like the living apparition we heard about in episode 210. By aerial materializations, they mean a temporary body that materializes out of the air and then dissolves when it's no longer needed. Material, uh, medieval authors often thought that angels materialized aerial bodies for themselves when they needed to interact with humans and then released the bodies and let them dissolve again once they no longer needed to interact. And the idea here is that God might do the same thing for saints to allow them to manifest in a distant location in a physical way. But you think personally think it is possible for God to make a body present in more than one place by space folding. Does the evidence indicate that this is what he's doing? Well, here's a place where I have more sympathy for Aquinas and people of his view. I think God could make a body circumscriptively present or present in the normal way in two places. But I think that phantasmal replications are the likely explanation for bilocation accounts where a person is seen. And I have a specific reason for saying that. Let's go back to the example where you fold a piece of paper and then put your hand into the fold. If you wiggle your fingers inside the fold, then they will be wiggling on both surfaces of the paper, both the upper surface and the lower surface. You'll see them thus doing exactly the same thing in both places. They might be mirror images of each other, but you'd see the same actions at the same time. And that's not what is reported to happen in cases of bilocation. 
For example, Padre Pio was sometimes seen in his friary to stop and become motionless during his bilocations, like he was concentrating or meditating or even sleeping. But hundreds of miles away in the Udine home uh, for the uh, Rizanis, you didn't just see him frozen and looking like he was sleeping. Instead, you'd see him alert and moving around. So his body wasn't doing the same things in both places. And that suggests space wasn't simply being folded. That's more consistent with the idea of the version of him at the remote location was a phantasm or apparition that was under his mental control. And his attention had shifted away from his physical body to where his apparition or phantasm was appearing. What if someone tried to touch the apparition? If they wave their hand through it, would their hand just pass through? Maybe, but maybe not. Apparitions can involve multiple senses, including not only sight and sound, but also touch. So if you tried to touch one of Padre Pio's visible bilocations, your hand might not go through. It might be stopped by psychokinesis or mind over matter, but you could also explain the effect as a temporary aerial body that had materialized, though to me, psychokinesis would be the simpler explanation. So I see multi-sensory apparitions as being the most likely explanation for bilocations, in other words, phantasms. What can we say about bilocation from the faith perspective? Despite the fact that it's often reported among religious figures, including Christian saints and mystics from other religions, most of the phenomenon is accessible from the reason perspective. And so we've already covered most of what we need to say. However, I would like to call attention to a biblical passage that may, and I emphasize may, refer to a kind of bilocation. Earlier, we talked about the reported Marian bilocation, Our Lady of the Pillar, but we noted that the sources on it are from a thousand or more years later. Well, in the New Testament, St. Paul records an experience that happened just 14 years earlier. In 2 Corinthians 12, he writes, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Based on clues in the context, scholars are virtually unanimous that the man Paul is talking about is himself. But because of the situation he's dealing with, he's being modest and not explicitly identifying himself as the man who was caught up to the third heaven. Uh, Second Corinthians was written in AD 54 or 55, so the experience 14 years earlier would have occurred in AD 40 or 41. Why do you say this may have been a bilocation? Because Paul says he doesn't know if he was caught up to the third heaven in his physical body or not. He says that twice. If he was caught up in his physical body, then it would not be bilocation. The entire Paul would have just gone up. But if his physical body was still on earth, but his consciousness was caught up to third heaven, it would be a form of bilocation, or at least it could be. Couldn't you just explain that as him having a vision of the third heaven? Oh, sure. But as we've covered, visions of distant locations may just be one of the forms that bilocation takes. God may even set up two-way visions where you're seeing a distant location, and as you're doing that, the people at that location are having a vision of you. So. I don't think we can draw a sharp line between visions and bilocations. The two phenomena may overlap, like a Venn diagram, where you have some visions that are not bilocation and some bilocations that are not visions, but there can be some visions that also are bilocations. Incidentally, uh, St. Paul's uncertainty about whether he was in his body or not, that corresponds to what Padre Pio said it was like when he experienced bilocation. In 1921, the church was doing an investigation regarding, among other things, mystical phenomena associated with Padre Pio, and in the process of doing that, they took some depositions from him. In one of them, they asked him this. Question. People also talk about episodes of bilocation. What do you have to say? Answer. I don't know how it is or the nature of this phenomenon, and I certainly don't give it much thought. 
but it did happen to me to be in the presence of this or that person, to be in this or that place. I do not know whether my mind was transported there or what I saw was some sort of representation of the place or person. I do not know whether I was there with my body or without it. So like St. Paul, Padre Pio didn't know whether he was in his body or not when he bilocated, and he was explicitly open to the idea that his mind was transported to the distant location or that he was seeing a vision representing the distant location. He thought both were possible. We've also looked at the way religious bilocations may overlap with paranormal ones. Do you think that undermines the religious ones in any way? For example, like if someone said, Padre Pio was just a gifted psychic who used his paranormal abilities to bilocate. I don't see how this would undermine anything religiously. Let's consider an example. In 1 Corinthians 12, St. Paul talks about how the Holy Spirit gives each Christian spiritual gifts, and he names some examples of these gifts. And Aquinas says, grace perfects nature. So the Holy Spirit, in some cases, takes a natural ability that someone has and then uses his grace to elevate it and enable it to serve God. I would consider myself an example of that. I mean, whatever spiritual gifts I may have, I think the primary one is the gift of teaching. I can teach pretty well, even on non-religious subjects. You know, in fact, when I was in grad school, they gave me awards for teaching. And my teacher evaluations from the students were the highest in the department, including the regular faculty, um, at least in a couple of the semesters I taught. So even if I was not a Christian, God still gave me some natural teaching ability. And then upon becoming a Christian, the Holy Spirit has taken that and elevated it and used it in God's service to help other people figure out religious matters. So I don't see any opposition here. If God built paranormal abilities into human nature, like remote viewing or out-of-body experiences that can produce bilocation, then there's no reason he can't supernaturally elevate those abilities and use them for his purposes. So even if, even if Padre Pio was paranormally gifted, that wouldn't stop God from elevating and using that ability he gave Padre Pio to help other people in their faith lives, like when he just happened to bilocate to St. Peter's in Rome when Giovanna Rizzani needed her confession heard. Like so many situations we encounter in Catholic Christianity, this is a both-and situation rather than an either-or situation. God may have built some kind of weak ability into human nature, and he may then elevate and perfect it by his grace to do good in the world, as in the case of some saints. Furthermore, God can use his omnipotence to do anything he chooses. So some cases of bilocation may be purely supernatural in their causation with no human ability involved at all. So, Jimmy, what is your bottom line on the mystery of bilocation? Bilocation is a phenomenon that's reported in a variety of contexts throughout history. Uh, it's reported among mystics um, belonging to various faiths, including uh, Christian saints like Padre Pio. It's also reported in paranormal circles, such as remote viewers and people who, who have out-of-body experiences. It takes a variety of forms. In some cases, the bilocating person is seen and heard and seems to be fully physically there. In other cases, the bilocator is only perceived by some witnesses. In some cases, the bilocator may only be sensed, and he may not be sensed at all in, in other cases. Some experiences with bilocation are well documented enough that I think we have a genuine phenomenon here. Since bilocation is not just reported in religious settings, it suggests that it may be due in some cases to a weak ability that God has built into human nature. But that doesn't mean that God can't take this ability, perfect it, elevate it, and use it in the cases of saints. And God may sometimes cause bilocation directly without the human doing anything. Okay, excellent. Very good. So what do we have for further resources so that folks can look more into this? We'll have a link to Bernard Ruffin's book, Padre Pio, The True Story. Also, Francesco Castelli's book, Padre Pio Under Investigation, The Secret Vatican Files. Um, Paul Smith's book, Reading the Enemy's Mind. Also, articles on Padre Pio uh, by location, both one from Wikipedia and one from the Catholic Encyclopedia. We'll have Paul Smith's article, Out of the Body or Out of Your Mind, on uh, remote viewing and out-of-body experiences. 
also an article, uh, the one that was written by uh, his uh, fellow priest on Padre Pio's bilocations, also information on the life of Pythagoras and the life of Apollonius, so you can look up the, uh, the passages we quoted, and also information about Our Lady of the Pillar. Excellent. I tell you, I want to be able to remote view is and travel to other locations in these long New England winters. I'd like to go to Hawaii <laughs> when it's cold and snowy out. <laughs> Maybe you should practice on the Quadru- on the Quadrilene Islands. I think I might try doing that. <laughs> All right. So that's it from us. We would love to hear your theories about the mystery of bilocation. You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Send a tweet to at mys underscore world. You can join the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or call our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And we love to get your audio and video feedback. And I want to say a special thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work in this and uh, other episodes of Mysterious World. They do an awesome job, so be sure and check out their website if you have uh, any video editing or animation business that you need done. Also, you can see their work on my YouTube channel. So be sure and go to youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. I recently got feedback from a listener who had always listened to the audio version of our podcast, and then he decided to check out the video version, and he was like, wow, the video adds so much. So do go to youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, where you can uh, watch uh, Mysterious World videos as well as other videos that I do. And while you're there, I, I am trying to grow my YouTube channel. So I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you'll get a notification whenever I have a new Mysterious World or other video coming out. Also, a special thanks to my wife, Melanie, and my daughter, Isabella, who also provided some of the voice work in this episode. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Well, recently there has been a lot of talk coming from Russian President Vladimir Putin about possible use of nuclear weapons. And some have suggested that we could be closer to nuclear war than at any time since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't think we're actually that close to nuclear war at present, but next time we'll be telling you about the Cuban Missile Crisis and how nuclear war almost happened in 1962. Wow. Folks, be sure to get your very own Mysterious World t-shirt, mug, and more in our merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the Mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. (laughs) 